www.podbean.com Welcome to the Caldebian, you cop sucking motherfucking dog shit ass cunt bitch. Hi, right, welcome to Chicago Open Mic. I'm your host, Dean Ellis. Today I'm joined by the wonderful Ken Gar. Hey, thanks for having me. Ken, I, um, I did a podcast a couple weeks ago about moving to LA because you know, I, I hold court with comics and a lot of them had questions and I gave the best advice I could. Yeah. You've actually been here for, is it coming up on a year now? Yeah, over a year, yeah. Just over a year. Talk to me about your experience transitioning from Chicago to LA and then we'll go back from there. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's, it's very humbling experience you know because you get you know i had a lot of traction i guess in chicago you know i was working all the clubs and stuff like that but then you kind of come out here and uh you know you're like plankton in the ocean out here so i think i was surprised more than anything by the sheer volume of, of comedians that are out here uh it's just like the thousands you know <laughs> so stage time is hard to come by you know what made you feel like you were ready to leave um i think i just kind of felt like i did everything i could in chicago you know, I felt like I had a pretty good act and that it was pretty polished and that, um, you know, I, I quit my day job. Or no, actually, I got fired from my day job, but... Um, Small difference. Yeah, yeah, I got fired. I got like I got, I got fired the day before I was quitting, and um, which is great because I got unemployment. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think, like, the, the, the decision was really just, like, okay, I've done what I could out in Chicago, and now I want to go out to L.A., so... For comics in Chicago, thinking about coming out out here, what would you say is like a good income base to have? Yeah. Like savings wise, and then uh, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where to even try and live. Yeah, I mean it's you know it, it's just like Chicago. So, you know, the closer you get to Hollywood, the more expensive it's going to be. Um, I live in Burbank, which is actually pretty expensive. Um, I pay like a thousand dollars a month for like a tiny apartment. Um, but if you go out to like Glendale or like Studio City or even like uh, Village City, I think it's Village City, um, you can find like a little bit cheaper. I think the best way to go about it is to get a roommate, yeah. you know? Like I'm, I'm 37 so I can't live with anybody, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just a dick. <laughs> so like I don't, you know. I don't know. have time for you to put the cap on there. Yeah, I don't have time to have those discussions. So, um, so I, you know, I, I saved up a bunch of money from my corporate job. And, you know, I would say come out here with as much money as you can and expect it to go, uh, expect it to be gone in half of the amount of time you expect it to go. You know what I mean? Because you're just, you're going to have unexpected shit happen, you know, um, you, it's just, it's just going to go a lot faster than you think it will, so. I wish somebody had told me, like, just about everything is on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. So that's what I, I should have aimed to live as close to that as possible. Yeah. But I know that the comedy scene out here is sort of broken into different factions with the Nerd Melt and the Comedy Store and the Laugh Factory. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the territories or yeah. what those scenes are like? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that uh, you, again, sim it's, it's somewhat similar to Chicago in that, you know, you've got, uh, depending on what type of comedy you have, is really going to determine where you're going to hang out. So I'm a club comic. I've always have been, and I've always been comfortable in the clubs. Fancy comedian wants to perform in comedy <laughs> and club. Wants to make money doing it, you know. So, um, so I hang out at the Ice House where we're at today, um, you know. But uh, you know, the Laugh Factory is a great stage. The Improv's a great stage. You know, those those are clubs, right? Um, Nerd Melt has really been blowing up. Um, you know, uh, Kumail and Jonah did a really good job of really putting that one on the map. And um, it's more of your kind of like, I wouldn't call it alt comedy, or I don't even know what you call it, but it's like smarter comedy. Yeah, I guess alt comedy, but... Um, you say nerd comedy. Yeah, you could say nerd comedy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the nerdist, right? Um, and then, you know, you've got, um, obviously, you've got like your bar shows and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time at the comedy store like you do, um, because that's really like where the best networking is done. So you might not necessarily do a lot of shows there, but you know that's where everyone kind of hangs out after they're done with their shows, and, and that's it's just that's why I love that that vibe, that feel, because everybody goes there, um, other, except the people that hate the comedy store. So, <laughs> well, like I haven't been to a lot of places, but that's the place that feels the most like Chicago to me. Where yeah, like I, I understand this interaction of things. Right. 
Um, so you work here at the Ice House. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to, you know, start emceeing here? What was sort of your process in actually getting traction out here? Yeah, I was pretty um, fortunate. I I um, I worked at uh, Brad Garrett's Comedy Club in okay. Las Vegas, and she, the booker of that, used to book the Ice House, and okay. so. I asked her, you know, hey, about the booking process. She's like, well, I don't book it anymore. Uh, Jan Smith books it. So she gave me his email address and, and a recommendation. So he put me on his Comedy Time show, which is his monthly showcase. Okay. And then um, it's funny because he, he sent an email to me and another guy, like, hey, do you, do you want you guys want to MC the show? And I don't think the other guy even responded. I was like, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And so, you know, another lesson I would tell Chicago comics to come out here is like take every opportunity you can like even if you're a headliner no one gives a shit like the MCs out here have been on Letterman like two or three times you know what I'm saying so take every opportunity you can a lot of people feel like I don't want to go there and play the game and have to kiss a lot of ass if you felt like there was a lot of ass kissing no I mean I stand behind my work you know what I mean yeah. so I, I think it's not ass kissing as, as much as it's just being polite and being open to meeting people. You know what I mean? So I'm not like, oh man, that was a crazy awesome set that you did. I'm just like, hey, I just moved here from Chicago, which, you know, if, and if I thoroughly enjoyed their set, I'll be like, hey man, I really liked your set, you know. And, and I'll ask other comedians that have been here for a long time about advice and what they think. And it's a pretty chill community, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, until you're successful, and then everybody hates you. But, um, but no, I mean, I just... I, well, I got the sense it wasn't even a community because people, they're not even really about their groups. It's just sort of everybody's focused on themselves. Yeah. And they're not worried about what you're doing. Right. I mean, it, honestly, it doesn't, you know, it, it really doesn't matter because uh, you, you really only want to focus on yourself, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? So it's not like, oh, here's the jocks and here's the nerds and here's the, you know what I mean? It's like everyone kind of mixes and matches and, you know, my... I've always said this, like, I, I hope one of my friends makes it so I can write for him or something. You know what I mean? Like, you're just, you, you kind of just get, you, you graduate with a class, and that's kind of how it happens, you know? I've heard there's a little bit of backlash against Chicago comics. Is that something you've experienced or seen at all? I haven't really seen it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not past the factory, the, the store, or the improv yet, but, so maybe that rings true, but I don't think it's because I'm from Chicago. I just don't think I've been given the opportunity to show them what I can do yet, so... But no, I, I really don't think... I, I haven't really encountered anything like that. Now let's go back. <laughs> How did you get into comedy in the first place? Um, so I, I started at Second City. Um, was it an improv or anything? Yeah, I was doing improv there. Um, a friend of mine had done it, and she basically was like, you should try it, you're funny. And, and so, you were trying to sleep with her? And no, it wasn't even like that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like... Uh, you know, she just encouraged me to do classes. And then I, what I started doing, I started doing stand-up with uh, guys from Tony and Tina's wedding. Okay. And so, like, I'd run into guys like Bill Cruz. He was just starting out, and, you know, uh, Leibovitz, I think, was starting off. And so a lot of those guys, uh, you know, I would just, after class going, we, we did a rugby bar. So Well, back then, I think there was only, like, five places to do comedy. Yeah, like the Lion's Den or something. I, I went there once, and I just, I didn't even, I never went again. I was so intimidated, and so, <laughs> like, just... Like, those guys were going to hate me, and nobody was going to listen to me, you know what I mean? So I just, I never went back again. <laughs> so, um, and then I hit, you know, like the suburban clubs and stuff like that, or open mics too. Do you still do improv and, and acting and other other forms of expression outside of stand-up, or does it sort of come down to that, that's it, your primary focus? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm an actor, so I'm doing yeah, a movie okay, right now. It. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know, I'm like, I kind of got forced into it, but... uh I um <laughs> Spielberg wouldn't leave me alone. Yeah, he kept calling. He, you know, but I uh he's so clingy. Yeah, he's so needy. Um, but I um uh I, I was a friend of mine moved out here. He was a comedian in Chicago too, and he wrote a movie and he's getting it produced. And so uh, I started off as like a PA, okay. and then one day like an actor didn't show up, which is beyond me. And I'm like, well, I can do the line. And then now all of a sudden, like they decided to put me in the whole movie. So, awesome. yeah, it was really cool how it worked out. Um, so, I mean, I've got a commercial agent, but you, you kind of get one of those when you get off the bus, you know. So, um, yeah, I guess I, like my goal has always been stand-up, but if I, can, if I can pay for my stand-up by doing acting until yeah. the stand-up starts paying, then I'll, I'd love to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you can do the comedy for free and make your money someplace else, yeah, exactly. that much better. Long term, do you want to stay in L.A.? Or do you see yourself going to New York? No, I'll stay in LA. I, I, I actually, I'll, I'll go visit New York and stuff, but I don't. I, I've never liked New York. I've been there, 
And uh, you gotta give me that. You gotta explain that story. To here's me. so here's the story. So I was out here. I was I was gonna do two weeks in LA, okay. and then I was gonna do two weeks in New York, and then I was gonna figure out where I wanted to live. Right? I came out here. And I met a New Yorker who was on vacation, and she was wearing a jersey. She was wearing a Jeter hat, and a Yankees hat, and she was just the most New York person you could. And, I, and I'm like, and I didn't like her immediately. And I was just like, you know what? Like, I don't want to. I don't wanna live there. Like, I, I hate winter. I'm done with it. I had some family out here, which is a big thing. Um, a lot of my buddies, like that, I kind of grew up in the clubs had come out here. So, you know, it's where I felt comfortable, so I didn't even go to New York, but um, I had been there before on business, and I just was, I just didn't like it. You know, I think you have to, either, either you love it or you hate it, and I just was never a big fan. Well, what about, like, you did actually go there for two weeks, yeah? I know, I know, I never did. Oh, no, I decided right one there. Bra, just one yeah. Bra. And what's funny is, what's funny is that I was, I was up by uh, Mulholland or whatever, and, uh, I was like, like, just like looking off in Hollywood, and then I was listening to Pandora, and uh, Will Smith's Fresh Prince song came on. I was like, "Well, that's a sign." I'm like, "All right, I'll stay here." Like, <laughs> I love those uh, Pandora angels. Yeah, right. You're just trying to find an answer, hoping the radio <laughs> yeah. will give you some sign. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? Uh, give me like, what's one of your best experiences in comedy, or your favorite bombing story? Um. Go. Pleasure or pain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, so far, I think one of the biggest highlights is playing Vegas, you know. Um, I think, you know, it was definitely on my comedy bucket list, and, I, you know, I wanted to play one of the major casinos, and I've played two, so... Um, That's a, very recently, you were just there last week. Yeah, a couple, yeah, a couple weeks ago at the MGM Grand, and then... Uh, Are you uh, middling or headlining? No, I'm just, uh, I'm seeing right now. Yeah, I do, but they, it's kind of cool, they do... As the MC, I do 20 minutes up front, and in the middle there's 30, and the headliner does 40. So it's like everyone gets plenty of time. Um, so it's a uh, it's a great club. It's beautiful. Like, what is it like performing to that many tourists? It's not. You know, you just gotta like. Uh, I, I think having got gone up in the clubs, I think it's really helped me out a lot. So, you know, I've I've done a lot of MC work through the years, and. Um, you know, I I try to keep it cleaner, especially at the MC spot, and, and I think um, and I try to keep it more general, like family stuff, and then marriage, and then dating. You know, so um, I you know, but I think funny's funny. So you know, I haven't really, I very very rarely run into a bad crowd there. You know, um, you do actually you run a show here, an open mic at the Ice House. Yeah. Um, they use the lottery system, which I guess a lot of a lot of the clubs here in LA use. Yeah. Was there any thought behind that, or was that the system in place when you got here? No, I mean the system was a typical. Uh, everyone put their name in, and then you draw it out. And then I was at the Improv, and they kept pulling names one at a time, and it kept the people in there. Yeah. And you know what, comedians hate it, but I don't give a shit. <laughs> like honestly, like like it, what's the point of having an open mic if there's nobody in the room? Yeah. So I like to keep it supportive. I like to keep the energy. High. High, um, you know, I take a lot of pride in the open mic, and and I'm I'm tired of going to shitty open mics. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, if you can't beat them, then do it, you know. So uh, I genuinely appreciate that if somebody doesn't get up, you'll give them a, a spot next week, guaranteed. Yeah. which is it's been phenomenal. This has been the best mic I've been to in terms of just just an open mic. Oh, thanks. Where the audience is very receptive and it's a good atmosphere. Yeah, and we're starting to get like six, seven regular customers come in, and you know. Uh, we I get weekly plugs on the Twitter for the Ice House, and you know, people are coming in before the eight o'clock show just to check it out. And I think it, you know, it really can become something bigger. You know what I mean? And you know, I, I like my favorite part is kind of just seeing a lot of the comedians come along and grow. You know, as as comedians, because you know, obviously it's an open mic, so we got people that are just starting and yeah. people that are just. Um, There's always at least two people. It's the first time. Oh yeah. But I also see here a lot of the regulars at the comedy store. Oh yeah. I, I don't necessarily see them out every place that I go. So. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the quality of stage time they're going to get at this mic. You know, um, I think you know one of the big things is that, um, and and this is this is one of the things that I've learned about L.A. is that. There's no one that is uh, teaching them like kind of how to do things, and, and I know that's kind of like I don't mean that to be a controversial statement, 
but there's really nobody teaching people how to MC out here. There's nobody really teaching people how to run a show out here. Like, like you, you coming from Chicago, you've got that Midwest blue collar mentality. Like, get to the gig a half hour early. You know, be polite. Like, check in with the, the you notes. know. Yeah, give, don't be a dick about giving notes. Right, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, I kind of, I've, I've kind of made this a Chicago open mic here at the Ice House, and you know, I, I haven't had any complaints because I think people respect what I do. But I'll give people notes. You know, I'll make fun of them on stage if they bomb. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's part of the process. And and everybody out here in LA is like so PC and don't hurt anybody's feelings. And it's like, well, they're never gonna grow. Like. You know, a lot of these comics that get started start doing bringer shows, and so they're you know they're they're performing in front of their friends, and there's like maybe a hundred people in the room, and it's like their first time on stage, and it's like they think like, oh well, I've made it already, like I'm at the comedy store, like I'm doing it, like no, like you, you have to go through a, a shitload before you're ready for that. I think there's a lot of eye on the prize too, because you're starting here and you see how close you are to making it. Yeah. Whereas in Chicago. There's, there's limitations on how far you can go, so that ambition just sort of gets ground out of you until it's like, yeah. all right, now I'm purely about the art form. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Chicago. I'm, in Chicago, I didn't get to uh, do a, a guest spot on a Friday for like three years at a club. You know what I mean? <laughs> and even then, like, I went over by my time by like a minute, and he like reamed me for it. You know? So yeah, no, this was uh, the Barrel out in Oak Lawn. You know? So. So you, I think you learn like how to be a comic in Chicago, and it, and to your point, there's not a lot of comics that make it out of Chicago. So I think it helps you to be the best comic you can be while you're there. I think that has been one of the saddest things coming here, realizing I know a lot of people that are, are sort of more talented than me or as talented as me, but sure. they may never leave, and that means they probably won't. That's it. Oh, in Chicago? It, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of a hard, heartbreaking thing to realize how important it is to leave. Yeah. It, it it's and, and that was when I when I got fired from my job I called Mikey O who's a, a friend of mine and I said well I'm gonna do stand up full time you know can you tell me about Humboldt Park where should I, where I should live he goes we we can stay here for it. he's like leave he goes you know and I respect him immensely and it's just like there's nothing left for you to do here he's like go to New York go to L A and stick a flag in the ground and see what happens. And he goes, because uh, because nothing's gonna happen out here, you know. So, you know, even we we even had TBS just for laughs in Chicago, and I still don't think any industry showed up. Yeah, very limited, you know. There was one Oprah special, and then uh, yeah, yeah. Things got. What's uh, some of the best advice you've ever gotten in comedy, or that you've given, you know, with younger cats that you help out? Yeah, I think um, you know some of the best advice that I've gotten is uh, well, two things like I, you know, dealing with nervousness before a show. Uh, a headliner once told me he's like uh, I said how, how do you how do you fight nervousness before a show because you seem pretty laid back Lots and he's like and he goes no he goes <laughs> he goes uh, he goes I don't he goes I don't give a shit about the audience and I'm like well I mean that's why we're here and blah, blah, blah. he's like no he's like they don't know what we're doing they don't know what it takes to stand up here and tell jokes and formulate jokes and all the shit that we have to go through the sacrifices that we have to make he goes so oh, I'm up there for me he goes, and I hope that they laugh. And for me, like once I heard that, I was just like a light went off. I was like, you know, it's true. It rings true. Um, and that helped me kind of deal with nervousness. And I'm, I'm not really nervous unless it's like a big, big show or something. Along those same lines, I saw Kurt Fox the other day, and he was saying like, a comic bombed and acknowledged that he bombed. And yeah. Kurt goes, the audience doesn't, the audience doesn't know that that didn't work. Right. Like, had you not said anything? They'd have just assumed they yeah. didn't get it. So yeah. You just plow through. There's, you don't necessarily have to acknowledge everything that doesn't work. And I think that that's one thing that I've I've learned through the years is that you always have to remain in command of the stage. You know what I mean? Like it's that's you're the boss no matter what. And audiences smell weakness and they smell fear. And once they smell it, you lose credibility. Yeah. So even if the joke bombs, I'll just just keep going to the next one, or you know, I'll find something that they'll like eventually. There's a lot of little things about like never take a step backwards or no. I remember when I first started that I would see people like crouch behind speakers, like they would start out at the microphone and move to the corner of the room by the end of their set. Yeah, they're so terrified. Yeah, or they lasso the microphone cord. Or uh, you were saying there was two things. What was the other? The other thing is in regards to kind of um, getting into clubs is to build relationships with them. So you know, I spent 15 years in sales prior to you know 
leaving sales. So like Glenn Glen Ross over here. Yeah, so it was like uh, always be comedy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, always be joking. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think the big thing for me was like you know hang out at the clubs, and I see like a lot of LA comics are like, well, how are you getting into this club and that club? And um, I said uh, I hang out at the clubs. You know, I, I get to know the staff, I get to know the managers, not in like in a phony way, but I'm just. You know, plus I want to be there anyway, so, so um, hey man. So, so that's something Ari Shapiro was talking about. He said 90% of your opportunities will come from other comics, so just hang out. Yeah. It'd be cool, just be there. Yeah. People will figure out who you are and help you along. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you're funny, they're going to want you on the show. So you have one of my favorite jokes of all time. <laughs> What's that? It's uh, the three minute chunk, well I'm sure it's probably longer than three minutes, about you know that your girl is going to leave you. Oh yeah. And I've lived through that, where like she starts working out. I had that. It starts separating yeah. her things. I lived yeah. through. That was my, how I got divorced. Yeah. And I, like, had I heard that bit, maybe I could have salvaged my marriage. Sure. You could have saved a marriage. Oh, I know. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. But <laughs> talk to me about where that bit comes from. Like, you say you live alone, so I yeah. know you're divorced. Are yeah. You, I, I assume that comes out of reality. We we talk to us about that bit. If you maybe you want to set it up a little bit, I mean, yeah. you don't have to do the bit, but <laughs> well, it's it's actually very recent. So I I moved out here with a girl that I was dating in Chicago. Okay. We broke broke up before I moved out here, and then I was missing her. And we got back together, and she's like, "Hey, let's give it a shot." So she came back out here, and then a lot of the the things that she was doing, you know, were the same patterns that my ex wife was doing. Where I was like. Oh, I'm gonna go. I'm, I, just, I think I, I just need to work out. I just feel like I just need to work. I'm like, well, I'll work out with you. No, 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 it's okay. It's like, oh god, you know. I mean, so and like then the great line about like, <laughs> I'm just gonna do 72 hours of hot yoga a week. Just yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> and then like, go, like my my wife ended up doing um like the spin classes like five days a week at like 5:30 in the morning. Ex wife. So ex wife. Ex wife. Ari Manis just walked in. Would you like so. to join us, Ari Manis, for a podcast? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Arimanis.com. <laughs> um, at at Arimanis on Twitter. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So that so then I just started like all right, and I, then I started focusing on like all of my relationships and what were some of the common things that happened, you know, because girls know, like they absolutely know when they're gonna break up with you, and then you know the overall cold. And I don't know, obviously, know what your your divorce was like, but like. Like, my wife was very cold when the decision finally was the made. The you have you know? about, like, she showed up in a pantsuit. Yeah. Because it was all business at that right. point. Right, yeah. <laughs> there was definitely a shift where it was just like, oh, now suddenly she's business and I have no idea what's going on. Oh, right. She's been planning this like a coup. Like, yeah. she's ISIS coming in. And oh, yeah. You have no <laughs> idea. One thing, like, you're, you're, like, out at the river cleaning your clothes against the rocks and the next thing it's like... <laughs> Uh, why are we being bombed? Um, and then you go as a as a husband, um, and every relationship is different. But you go into this like I can save this mode, yeah. you know. Like let's go to counseling, and I'm, I'll start reading books. And yeah. okay, I will pick up my socks. Like it's no, you know. But by then it's too late. You know, like the decision's done. You know? Neil Brennan's got a great joke, and hopefully I'm not spoiling spoiling anything. Sure. <laughs> um, he talks about like when you're in your 20s and you're dating. You just assume whoever you're dating is what you're into. Because yeah. you have no life experience to judge it against. So it's yeah. like, I guess I'm into bipolar girls. Yeah. Because you have no idea to know that you're not. Yeah. Your first marriage, do you feel like there was a sense of... Uh, uh, I'll say to guys, like, are you dating based on your interest or based on, like, your values? Yeah. Because you'll meet someone and be like, oh, they like the comic books and movies that I like. They must be perfect. But yeah. Completely different value system. Well, I, well, I think... To get in, not to get in too deep into it, but we had very similar Dr. interests. Ken. Well, no, I mean, we had very similar interests, very similar values, very similar upbringings. We were in love. We were best friends. So everything made sense. Yeah. But I think we had a lot of issues that we didn't talk about before the marriage. Like, her and I weren't good at fighting. Okay. We're both, we were both pleasers, so we weren't like, hey... Like, let's really talk about this. Or Like, we were afraid to fight. I'm you currently know I mean? in that relationship. Are you? <laughs> Don't, man. Just fight. Like, I, the, the last relationship, and although it wasn't, it didn't work out, but we were really good at fighting because it was like, <laughs> you know, we call each other out on our bullshit. You know what I mean? A lot of times I'm like, okay, it's fine. Like, we'll just not talk about it and here's some flowers. But that's bad because all that shit builds up and then one day they start working out. <laughs> the pants suit just <laughs> then, then they go and they pick up the pantsuit from the dry cleaners. So. Were you married when you started comedy? No, I you, no, I was doing comedy before we got married. And I think for her the kind of the writing was on the wall because you know, it went from like 
you know, doing it every like, every once in a while to like every single weekend I was getting booked. It's my and, hobby to a profession. Yeah, and you know, I think she wanted kind of that nine to five stability and security, and, and it just wasn't me. So now I know uh, you know a lot of people when they start they don't have a lot of life experience. So yeah, the material tends to be like dick jokes, fart jokes. Because mm -hmm. you're 20, what are you going to talk about? Yeah, you've gone through quite a bit to shape and grow as a man. Yeah. How has your comedy and your life sort of changed along those lines? Of it? Of course, it's been 10 years? 13 now. 13? Yeah. 10 years, that's a lot of growing as a person. Yeah. And I'm sure your act has changed with that growth. Yeah. I mean, a uh, comic asked me, he's like, well, how do you, you know, how do you come up with, you know, such, he, you know, he, he was just like, this great material. And I go, I go, fall in love, man. Go get dumped. <laughs> go get divorced. Yeah. Start doing drugs. Drink get arrested you know like go do some shit I go the lead a life we're talking about and I said and if you can't if you can't do that or that's not you because I see a lot of LA comics that are seven nights a week four nights four mics a night and I get that but when are you living your life yeah I'm like you want to go you want to I go you want to get inspired to write something I go go hang out at a courthouse that's a big thing in Chicago is people with mics so much eventually their material would just be about being at mics right so I think it's important to kind of just go out and experience some of that shit and live a life so that you know what you're doing, you know? Do you have any questions for, for Ken? This is one of the hottest podcasts going on right now. Seems like it. It's yeah. the hottest I one on this patio. Uh, what do people need to know about Ken? What's some, some good advice Ken's given you? Ken once told me that all great comedians have to go through a divorce. Yeah, it's true. So I'm really trying to get married. <laughs> <laughs> I said mar marriage is your first album, yeah. it's divorce is your second album, and then uh, dating 20-year-olds when you're 50 is your third album. <laughs> That's pretty much how it goes. I think mine's going to go divorce, recovery. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still love me? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's actually probably pretty accurate as well. But, I mean, I just think you have to live life, though, to just to understand what's funny about it. How do you feel like your act, though, has changed over the last 10 years? Like, I'm sure your style of writing has, has grown immensely. What are some breakthroughs you've had? Yeah, I think for me, um, just, and it's, it's cliche, in the, especially when you're talking about comedy, but it, just digging deeper, you know, and getting more personal on stage, you know? So it used to be like, oh, I'm going to talk about, you know, growing up in a house full of firefighters, and I'm going to talk about my great grandma who was 114. You look like talk a firefighter. Yeah, I know, but. <laughs> Um, but now, now I, I talk about like my divorce or I talk about the pains of dating in your late thirties or I talk about, you know, a DUI or, you know what I mean? So like, I, I do love your bit about dating in your thirties. It's just <laughs> like, you, you want to go home? Yeah. Are we going to do this? Yeah. You don't care anymore. Like, you, like you're just like, well, I got, I got some leftover lasagna in the fridge and that sounds good. And I might do that. You know? Who am I courting? Right. <laughs> What, are we going to wait wait three months and sleep together? That's that's what makes Tinder so great. It's just like, either you, like, I don't, it's in numbers. It's, it's sales 101, you know what I mean? Are you the person that has the joke where it's like uh, single people looking to fuck people that want long-term relationships? No. Uh -huh. I, I apologize to what no. the joke that is. I, yeah. I didn't give you credit. No, my, my whole thing with, uh, with, with Tinder is that it's just, it's just like being in sales. It's like, all right, there's 100 girls. <laughs> If I can match with ten All the and get three to talk to me, and out of those three, you get one to have sex with me, like I win. <laughs> like I've I've closed the deal for the month. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and you're you're good to go. So, well, why don't we close out with this? What is your best bombing story? Oh, by far, it's the VFW in Justice, yeah. Illinois, or no, Summit, Summit, Illinois. How did you even get booked at a VFW? Who was with you? Brian Hicks called me. He's a Chicago comic, been around for a long time, and he couldn't do the show. Yeah. He had tickets to something, and he's like, hey, you mind doing it? It's a VFW, and it's a trucking meeting. So it's a bunch of truckers got together to have their meeting. and uh, a core audience. Oh, just, yeah, my demographic all the way. So I get in there, and uh, they're, they just finished their meeting, and there's this panel of this table of, of the commissioners or whoever they were, right? And they just talked about how much gas prices were, so they were all pissed off. There are no women in the room. And so uh, they're like, all right, now we got a comedian whose name's... Ben Ben Jar, and uh, and then these guys stayed in their seats, like at the commission panel. Like they didn't join the audience. There was like so it was just like, it's like oh. coming up to the day of Santa Rose. Uh, oh yeah, exactly. With with no and so then you try crowd work, but they're so mad and they don't know who you are. And there's no like so then it's just like fuck you, you know, like just yelling shit, heckling. But 
ironically, just like every other gig you bomb, afterwards they're like, that was great, man. You were awesome. Like, what? Like, Did you throw any of those yellow bottles at you? No. Thank God. <laughs> they just threw gas cans at me. Like, fucking fill it up. I'm like, okay. But All that... Right. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, and uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to play some material from Ken Gar. Thanks a lot, Ian. I was married for a while, didn't work out, got divorced. Be honest with you, I didn't want to get divorced, but my wife's boyfriend was insistent. <laughs> He's a good guy, they're getting married. Anyways. Here's the thing though, right? Here's the thing, and you married folks know what I'm talking about. Maybe not after a year and a half, you guys are honeymooners. So. But there are rules in marriage, right? And no one ever explains these rules to you. Like, for example, I was 30 and I had a bedtime. What is that bullshit? <laughs> we had a bedtime. It wasn't like we talked about going to bed. She just shut the television off and it was time for bed. <laughs> like, babe, that was the Super Bowl. I don't care. Get your jammies on. Night, night. Let's go. Bullshit. <laughs> Can I go potty? Hurry up. Pick out a story. Let's go. You have to ask for permission to do everything, don't you guys? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm good with that. That's awesome. Yeah. You're watching a movie. Something real simple, watching a movie. All of a sudden, I get up to use the bathroom. She pauses and goes, where are you going, sweetheart? I'm going to go take a shit. <laughs> well, then when you be back? When it comes out. No, it's hard. I'll be back in four games of solitaire. That's when I'll be back. <laughs> Four winning games of solitude. Because no one leaves the bathroom a loser. <laughs> this guy asked me last week, hey man, how, how come you got divorced? I'm like, I don't know, guy at Starbucks, can I have my coffee, please? <laughs> but there's never one reason why you get divorced. It's a multitude of reasons. But I can tell you, the beginning of the end of my marriage was when we went on a couple's diet. If you're on a couple's diet right now, get off that shit. Get off. It's a no-win situation. I'm a guy, which means I can lose nine pounds in four days by not thinking about butter anymore. I'm losing a pound right now. It's amazing. Meanwhile, it took my wife six months to lose about a pound and a half. And all of a sudden, I'm the asshole because I'm losing weight faster than her. Right? So what do you do? You try to be a good husband, so you start cheating on the couple's diet. I'm eating McDonald's like every other day, but I'm not an idiot. So I hide the McDonald's bag in my neighbor's garbage can, and now he's getting divorced. So I'm dating now, right? Dating after, dating after your divorce is amazing. You know why? I don't give a shit anymore. <laughs> I've been married. I, I don't want to settle down. I don't want kids. My pickup line right now, are you ready, ladies? Is, so do you wanna? That's my pickup line. <laughs> That's it? Because if not, I'm going to go home, make a hot pocket, and put a heating pad on my back. <laughs> I said, I don't care if you come home with me. I got PlayStation. I'm going to be in the Super Bowl tomorrow. <laughs> it's different, though, man. It's different the older you date, right? You're in your 20s. You take home a girl. All you got to be like, you got condoms back at your place? Now I'm in my 30s. I'm like, you got Tums back at your place? Because I had pizza for dinner. That shit's coming back. You know what I'm saying? Especially if we're gonna lie down for four minutes. 